We have Dr. Erica Miners, who is a phenomenal person, and she is going to give us a great perspective on Dr. Addison and how this got started. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, how many mics do I have here? Is this the right one? <laughs> is this good? Can folks hear me? Um, uh, first, I just want to start by um, saying that Nicole Holland, Dr. Nicole Holland, asked me to f make a few remarks about Ken and why this event. But first, I would like to honor the work and vision of Dr. Nicole Holland, Florinas Serb, Libby Van Opstel, Tammy Dobbins, uh, Ann Botts, Crystal Hugh, that made this event possible. Wonderful women. Um, I, I know that Ken is probably packing up his bags at this moment <laughs> and checking out the fire alarm poles or the emergency exits because he does not seek the spotlight. In part, we had to kind of trick him a little bit to come here today. In particular, I left messages saying, relax, it'll be casual, or this event is not really about you, but about what you <laughs> represent at the university. And yes, in a sense, this last text message is not a fib. Ken's commitment to education, to people, to community, to showing up and throwing down for justice is in a sense representative of wider struggles and the work that many engage in to use the mercurial tools available at universities to advance movements for economic, racial, and gender justice. But through another lens, this is very much about Ken and the kind of spaces and lives he made possible at this public institution. The material contributions are significant. Ken created and taught the first required graduate course in the teacher certification program that focused centrally on race and gender. Ken was part of the team that developed the AFAM studies uh, uh, minor. A strong believer in the mantra of people over policy, Ken consistently supported the most marginalized or rendered individual, individuals and communities in every context. Ken was also a tireless advocate for new faculty, in particular faculty of color and or women. But beyond some of the material contributions, Ken cared about people and was the person, my office was next door to Ken's for over 10 years, that people went to in trouble. Um, he is a listener who remembers accomplishments and sick friends, birthdays and grief. And in the words of Toni Morrison, he consistently lets people, uh, lets himself not simply be touched by his encounters with people, but moved by people. A poet, a painter, a musician, a teacher, a scholar, he also routinely made himself available to work for free in community programs. How many times have I hustled you, Ken? <laughs> and he made my corner of the fourth floor of Lech Valenza Hall, sometimes raucous, sometimes delightful, always interesting. Ken's labor inside universities was not because he saw the university as a home, but rather, I speculate, he was motivated by a desire to put our, quote, queer shoulders to the wheel, end quote, to borrow a phrase from the poet Allen Ginsberg, and work alongside those willing to engage in tactics that decenter oppressive systems of power and build communities of resistance along the way. His retirement has left more than a gap. For example, on the North Campus with his retirement, there are no tenure stream black male faculty members in the College of Education. He leaves us with an obligation to continue to deepen the social justice commitments that he engendered in the faculty, staff, and students that he mentored and supported. We recognize and honor him today because, yes, yes, because of Ken and his labor, his political commitments, and his incredible generosity, but also because of the importance of recognizing this kind of institutional work that is often rarely recognized. We are honored to celebrate Ken Addison through this lecture for multicultural education and social justice, and through the establishment of a scholarship that will be awarded to students who've demonstrated a commitment in his or her professional life to economic, racial, and gender justice, activism, and advocacy. Thank you.